Tonight, we're going to finish our study of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll be picking up in verse 13. So if you haven't uh, watched the previous recordings, uh, we have uh, several other recordings about the introduction, all in chapter 1, and then last, uh, the last recording was chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. So you might want to go back and watch them uh, to kind of get you up to date. But we're going to pick up now in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 under this idea of character. Chapter 1 was about conversion, and chapter 2 is about character, really the character of Paul and his companions um, as they labored amongst the Thessalonians and their love and concern for them. But you also see some things about the Thessalonian character as well. And so let's begin by reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13 through verse 20, the end of the chapter. The Bible says, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and our joy. In these verses, <clears throat> we learn some things more about the character of the apostle and his companions. Now, first, in, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, we learned about the purity of their character, that when they were amongst them, you remember he, he goes through in the first half of, of the chapter going uh, negatively and then positively. We didn't come to you like this, but we came like this. We didn't behave ourselves like this, but we behave like this. Then the second, the second half of that section of chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 12, he stays all positive. This is what we did. This is what we did. This is what we did. Now, we're turning our attention to the pleasure that he found in the Thessalonian church. And we've already seen that, of course, in chapter 2 and verse 8, but he expounds upon it even more as he talks about the way that they, he has found pleasure in them and the way that they are pleasing to God, and uh, he will express that. And then to close the chapter, verses 17 through 20, we will focus in on his passion for the Thessalonians. Because if you're going to minister to people and you do not truly love them, you need to stop. And this having this zeal and this passion of wanting to be with the people of God, wanting to be with the people. And I understand in, especially in the office of ministry, so to speak, the official sense, we might call it, um, the people in a congregation do not belong to you, but they become your people in a sense of uh, you're the one responsible for teaching them. Uh, you, you're, you're interacting with them and communicating with them. And so they become people that are very near and dear to your heart. And uh, so you have a strong passion for them. And if you don't, then you uh, need to make some changes uh, if you're ministering to them. So let's begin, first of all, by looking at his pleasure in them. Okay, so in verse 13, he says, so we also thank God continually for this. So he, he launches in again and saying, and he's communicating over and over again to them throughout this letter, how thankful he is for them and for what they have done and what they continue to do. Now, he's going to focus in on one particular format or one particular area of Thanksgiving. He says that when you received the word of God, that is when the word of God came into your hearing, when we were at Thessalonica to preach the gospel to you, Acts chapter 17, which you heard from us, you accepted it. Now the word here for accepted is a word that means to welcome the word received just a few words previously is the concept of uh, listening and bringing in, but welcomed is to kind of embrace and wrap your arms around and really welcome it in as something that's not just in a common reception, but a, a, a warm embrace and welcoming. He says, you accepted what we said to you, not as, not as the word of men, okay, but as it really is the word of God, you were able to tell the difference, you see, because the Jews in that day said, you know, this is just some kind of other doctrine of men but you were able to understand and to receive, perceive it for what it was. Now, some of that may have to do with 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5, when he says, because our gospel came, not to you, uh, came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. 
but they were able to perceive that the message that was being preached was from God. Indeed, it had divine origin, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. It didn't originate from the will of man, but holy men of God were speaking as they were moved or borne along like, a, like the wind pushing a sail on a sailboat. Uh, that is, they were being borne along by the Holy Spirit. And so that's the way inspiration was working, and they had seen the evidence. Now, here is... <clears throat> something that's important. We still need to have this ability today, this ability to differentiate between the Word of men and the Word of God, and to differentiate between different layers of that contrast. Um, <clears throat> obviously, when we look at the Word of men versus the Word of God, we look at people who, who corrupt the Word of God, or who do not teach it faithfully, or do not teach it. They may be sincere, but misunderstood in certain areas. There's that layer. And then you've got another layer where a person may set forward this principle of they're preaching the word of God, but they're basically using the word of God, not in the sense that God communicated it and understanding the way the verses are meant in their context and within their book to preach the message as it is being understood, but they communicate it in the sense that the Bible is just kind of their springboard and they're just going to tell good little, they're just going to preach good little moral lessons out of the Bible. And so they treat it almost like, as one person has described it, Aesop's fables. You've got a little story, and you've got a moral of a story, and that's what you need to work with. And so some people treat the Word of God that way. They want to take a text, and they want to say, now here's the moral of the story. Instead of preaching it as if everything matters, and how everything is involved in this grand scheme, and this grand narrative of what God is doing in the world, what God has done in Christ, and what He desires to do in you. You see, in that subtle way, there's a difference between the preaching of the Word of God and preaching about the Word of God. And so <clears throat> they are able to receive it as it really is. And then he goes on to add this very interesting statement, which is at work in you believers. You see, the reason why a lot of people are disenfranchised with Christianity is because they've got nothing but moral little lessons out of these sermons and classes that we've been setting forth. But when you come along and you lay out the Word of God as it is written, you start to see the changes in the lives of people because you're preaching the Word of God as it is intended, and it begins to work in the hearts and in the lives of those who receive it. And it brings forth fruit, Luke chapter 8 and verse 15. And so he's very thankful for their reception, and they have pleased him because of the way they received it. But also, the second idea under this is that they have gone about a proper imitation. Imitation. Now, we've talked about the words mimic and imitation uh, already <clears throat> throughout this context, in, in chapter 1 especially. Now, they began to imitate the church, he said. You became imitators of the church of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. That is where the church began, Acts chapter 2, and the persecutions that they received. You can read about them all over the place from Acts 7, Acts 8, Acts 9, Acts 12. Um, and the interesting thing is that the person who is writing this letter, Paul, was the one who had inflicted so much damage on the early church, Galatians 1 and verse 13, um, second, or Galatians 1, 22 and 23, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13. And so he had firsthand experience on the persecution that happened to the early church in Judea because he had been the major inflictor of that persecution for so long. And so he says, you've become imitators in them because you've become imitators of those churches in the area of suffering, okay? You have, for you have suffered the same things of your own countrymen as they did of the Jews. Now, you remember it was the Jews who led the uprising in Acts chapter 17 and brought them to a Gentile court. And so ran Paul and Silas and Timothy out of town, Acts 17, 5 through 10. Now, <clears throat> here's one of the things we learn about Christianity. In an Americanized, watered-down version of the gospel, the message of the American gospel is serve God and everything in your life will be easy. The only problem is that's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's not one of the impacts of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, serving Jesus in the gospel will many times bring problems in the sense of external issues sufferings that can come upon us. They are something to be expected, John 16 and verse 33, Jesus warned us. In confirming the churches in Acts 14, they said, through much tribulation, we must enter the kingdom of God. Or 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Or 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12, in the Neronian persecution, he said, don't treat this like this is some strange thing that has come upon you. 
As a matter of fact, the early church treated it as a badge of honor. Acts chapter 5, 41 and 42, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the name or for the cause of Christ. And they saw it as a sign of service and being blessed, as Jesus would say in Matthew 5, 10 through 12. And so this church is suffering. And Paul is saying, you suffered the same things, okay? You're in the same boat as these churches in Judea. Then he focuses in on, on some past events that the Jews perpetrated. Number one, they killed, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets. Now, Jesus spoke of this in his own ministry, in his denunciation, his prophetic denunciation of the Jews in Matthew 23, and in this particular uh, heading, uh, verses 29 to 37, that they killed Jesus. They were involved in that process, of course. Luke 23, Acts 2, uh, all throughout the book of Acts, they are presented as the ones uh, who killed the Holy One who came from God, and the prophets. Okay, Now, the prophets here may have reference to Hebrew prophets, as most likely, um, but it also may have reference to Christian prophets like Stephen or, or um, <clears throat> the Apostle James in Acts chapter 12. But the point is that they killed the messengers of God. And so their persecution toward you is what he's saying. It's not something that should be thought strange. This is something that they've always done. And furthermore, it's not just something they did to the Lord Jesus and they did to the prophets, but they've also done it to us. They drove us out. Right? They drove us out. Of Thessalonica, Acts 17 and verse 10. They even came down to Berea and drove us out of Berea into Athens, Acts chapter 17, verses 13 through 15. Now, this is their present situation, the Jews, those who are persecuting, and those who are persecuting the Thessalonians. They have displeased God. They displease God in what they are doing. They think they are doing the right thing, but they are wrong in what they're doing. That's one of the things that we have to be cautious of. Romans 10, Paul said, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Or in John chapter 16 and verse 2, when Jesus said, the time is coming when people will think that when they kill you, they are doing God a service. How many people in the name of Christianity have not just, let's not even go to the extreme of killing people in persecution, but have tried to destroy people's lives and destroy their influence and destroy all these other things in the name of of serving God and standing for truth, when in actuality, they have no idea what truth is. That's what he's saying here. They're displeasing God, even though in their minds they are serving God, they are actually displeasing him. So don't take your persecution as an understanding of God's displeasure for you. God's displeasure is actually for the ones who are hurting you. And then he says, the, these Jews also oppose all mankind by hindering us to preach the gospel to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Not only do they reject the gospel, but they don't want the gospel going to anyone else either. They view it as their mission to, their mission to stamp it out, as Jesus would say again in that prophetic denunciation of Matthew 23, this time in verse 13, that they shut up the kingdom of heaven, they shut up the kingdom of God, and prevent other people from going in. And that's what they're doing. This is what's happening to you. And then there's this present and future tense idea, this tension. They said, uh, Paul goes on to say, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last. They're filling up the measure of their sins. This idea of filling up your sins, kind of the picture, and it's used several times throughout scripture, uh, explicitly and other times kind of visually, implicitly. Um, it's the idea of a cup, I guess, is maybe a simple way to illustrate it. And as we sin, we're pouring, we're filling that cup. But there comes a point in which you hit the brim of that cup. That cup will only hold so much, and then it begins to spill over. Well, our sins are pictured in that way in a certain sense. In that cup, God's mercy will only go so far. Sin has a, there is a line with sin when God said, that's enough. I can't allow it to go any further. You've reached the limit. For an example, Genesis, Genesis chapter 15 and verse 16, speaking to Abraham, he said, you can't go into the promised land right now because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. That is, they haven't reached a point yet where I can justly punish them, even though he wants them to repent, but he can't justly punish them because their sins have not reached that point yet. You see similar principles in Daniel 8, Matthew 23, and other places. Now, when he says to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last. This is a uh, somewhat... A difficult phrase to, to, to decipher. Um, 
does it mean that wrath is already resting upon them? Does it mean it's something to come into the future? Um, there are a lot of different ideas. I think there are multiple phases to it, definitely. Uh, God would show his ultimate displeasure. God would show his displeasure for the Jews in AD 70 when he destroyed the city of Jerusalem by the Roman Empire. But he will ultimately always show his displeasure towards sin at the final judgment when he will pronounce uh, a final word of condemnation upon it and send them away to be punished. And so, uh, what Paul is saying here, either way, is they're beginning to feel, you know, sin has its own wrath mechanism built into it, and uh, God can turn us over to sin, and it can, it can work some wrath and some difficult circumstances in our life as we try and, and uh, deal with it, uh, especially as we persist in it. But there's always, obviously, the ultimate sense and the, uh, the final sense uh, of the divine judgment of God. And so he's saying, don't think, in essence, they will escape the punishment of God. God sees exactly what is happening. And God is going to call them on the carpet, and he is going to um, demand an explanation, and that explanation will be insufficient for what they have done, and he will punish them for their failures and for their active persecution of his people. And so Paul, when he looks at this church, he is just so pleased with the fact that they were able to see and to understand that the message he was bringing was the word of God. It was not some man-made concoction. It was not a perversion of the gospel. It was the gospel as it had been revealed to him through the revelation of Jesus Christ, Galatians chapter 1. Now, <clears throat> with that intense persecution, though, he also had an extreme passion for them. He wanted to be with them. And that's something that um, when you love the people to whom you minister, when they're hurting, you have this burning passion to be there for them. Not because you're their savior. You know you're not their savior. And if you don't know that, then you should, and you will learn it the hard way. But you want to be with them. You want to stand there and be there with them. And you want to walk through that trial with them. And so you have this passion to want to get to them as quickly as possible. I mean, think about how many brothers and sisters in Christ, if someone called you today, and they, they spoke to you about some tragedy that had befallen them, how quickly you would drop everything and go to be with them because you have a passion for them. That's what Paul is saying here. I have a passion. I want to get back to you. But he's being hindered in some ways of, from doing that. So his passion for them is seen in two ways in this text. Number one, his attempts to get back to them, verses 17 and 18. And number two, the assessment that he makes of them in verses 19 and 20. So first of all, the attempts that he has made. Now, under this idea, there are three things here. First of all, the attempts to get back to them imply, number one, that they've been separated. And we've already seen that in Acts 17. And we'll talk about it more in just a second. Then there were the plans that Paul had laid out to try and get back to them. And then he was, number three, hindered. So first of all, their separation. And the word he uses here for separation is very interesting. It literally means to make an orphan. I've been orphaned. I've, I've been bereaved of you. I, I have I've been torn away from you, okay? But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, and in the process of this writing, somewhere around six to 12 months, so it's been six to 12 months since he's seen him. He says, I was torn away from you. He didn't get a chance to say goodbye to them the way he would to other congregations that he, would, that he had established. Acts 16, even under the persecution, when they asked him to leave, he was at least able to go back to Lydia's household and say goodbye to the people that he loved so dearly. On this occasion, he was forced to flee quickly and was never able to officially say goodbye to the people that he had served. And that's a very hard pill to swallow. Um, and it's something that, that leaves a hole in you when you're not able to do that. And so he's saying, I feel like you've been torn away from me. I didn't get a chance. He certainly didn't get this chance at closure with them that he wanted. He says, but <clears throat> I'm torn away from you in person, but not in heart. I will always have you on my mind. I will always be thinking about you, and I will always be praying for you. And um, so they've been separated. He says, but I want you to know I've also been planning. We have endeavored the more eagerly, and the word translated endeavored combines two ideas, speed and diligence. We've been working as hard and as fast as possible to get back to you. We just have been hindered in this process. He says, I, Paul, I want you to understand, even though I'm writing all three of us feel this way, but I, Paul, as the author, want you to know specifically that I have tried and tried to get back to you, but Satan has hindered us. And the word here used for hindered is the idea of throwing obstacles 
in the way of, of an oncoming army to make their uh, <clears throat> to make their journey to their destination more difficult. How in warfare sometimes you will blow up bridges or um, just create obstacles in the way, debris and things along that line to, to slow down the advance of the army. And that's what he's saying here. Satan has hindered us. Now, how Satan hindered them, we just simply do not know. It could be a citywide ban from Acts chapter 17. It could be the Jewish hindrances, Acts 17, 5 to 15. Um, I mean, it, it could be a million other things. We really just don't know. But we do know that Satan is the reason why he has been hindered uh, from coming back to them. And so he wants to reassure them that he is passionate for them, that he loves them, that he has not forgotten about them, and he has tried and tried to come and see them, but he has just been hindered by Satan every time he tried. And so he's trying to communicate this message to them. Then he closes with this wonderful assessment, kind of just bursts into joy about them. And he asks this, this great question, uh, which is somewhat rhetorical in its nature. He says, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ that is coming is the uh, obviously the second coming of Christ. And so he says, what is our crown? The crown here, in, in the Bible, there are two crowns spoken of. There's the crown worn by kings, the diadem. And then there's also the Stephanos, or the, the wreath that was awarded the athletic, went to the athletic, or to the winner of a competition, whether that was in athletics or even in warfare or, or things along that line. And so... <clears throat> The one that's used here is the one awarded to the winner in an athletic event or in warfare. And uh, as would take place many times, especially with the, with the athlete, um, the king would not be present in the Olympic Games or the Ismason Games or the other games that they would have competed in. And so when the winner of those games would, would appear before the king with his crown, he would take it off and put it at the feet of his king in honor and show him what he had, what he had done for his kingdom. And so what he, th this image that, that Paul is using here is that these Thessalonians, they're his crown. At the coming of the Lord Jesus, they're going to be the offering, so to speak, that he, that he lays at the feet of Jesus saying, these are the ones. This is what I have won for you. This is what I labored so diligently. These are the ones I talked to you about. These are the ones I prayed to you about. You know them obviously better than I do, but... This is, I just take such pride and joy in seeing how this group of people have prospered uh, in the gospel, and I'm so proud of them. And I know that in saying to God, in essence, I know that you are, and I know you know all this, and I know you love them, but I am so proud of them and the beaming joy that he feels for them. Um, it's just, uh, you can, again, see this ministerial heart of the apostle. Um, He's constantly looking at the, at the end, and it's motivating everything. And so his answer to that question is, is it not you? For you are our glory, our outward boasting, and you're our joy, our inward drive and contentment. Uh, he says the same thing of the Philippian church, Philippians 2, 16 and 4, 1, of the Corinthian church, 2 Corinthians 1, and verse 14. And uh, to that same Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 through 15, he talks about how we build how you build up the church and you have to be cautious about how you build and talks about the joy that will be felt by the evangelist, by the builder um, or the Christian who has invested in other people and, and led them to Jesus. And those people have remained faithful. And at the, the second coming, the joy that they will feel um, in watching those individuals in their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and, and to be ushered into heaven and, um, you know, that, that's really what ministry is about. You're, you're playing a long game. Most people <clears throat> want ministry that will produce instant results. The only problem is the instant results will most of the times be superficial. In ministry, you have to play the long game. You have to be looking at the end. You're looking at, okay, we're all going to stand in front of Jesus one day. Now, what do we need to do between now and then, however long that may be, or however short that may be? How do we get from where we are to a point where we can stand before him with confidence and boldness at his coming, 1 John 2 and verse 28? And so you're looking at the long-term effects, so you're investing in relationships, you're investing in people. And that's what Paul is seeing here in Thessalonians, and having invested all of this time and these people, he, he's looking forward to the time when, when he can present them to Jesus and say, 
this is it. This, this has, uh, you know, and, and that's where uh, the reward of the Christian who invests in other Christians, um, that's when you receive your reward. You will get it to a degree now in this life when you see people grow. And, and that's, that's really the coolest experience in the world and the funnest experience in the world to me um, is to watch people grow in Jesus. But to s the ultimate ecstasy that you will feel in seeing that person um, embraced by Jesus Christ at the, at the second coming and at the judgment day, and they are welcomed into that loving relationship and to know that obviously all of this was the work of Jesus Christ, but, but to know that maybe you, you had a small amount of influence in helping that person, um, it, it's, um, it's a tremendous motivator. So um, in this letter, this First Thessalonian letter, Chapter two, we're looking at the character of the minister. Uh, and really all of us are ministers. Every Christian is a minister. We all have the obligation to invest in other people, to help grow other people, and uh, to help them to be ready to present them uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ, as Paul would say in Colossians 1, 27 through the end of the chapter. And so <clears throat> uh, we might close by simply asking this, what, what are you personally doing to invest in other Christians? What, what Christian... Or what person who is not a Christian, when you when you began to know them, is now a Christian? And what Christian that you know now is stronger because they've had interactions with you? How have you made them better? How have you pushed them more toward the Lord Jesus Christ? Um, I think it's an important question. And uh, do you have this heart of purity, where you only want to help people, and you you have you are so pleased when you see people grow and develop in Jesus? And you had this, just this burning passion to see people um, become more like Jesus and look forward to the day when we can all stand before him together and hopefully be found pleasing in his sight. And, uh, <clears throat> but when we think about the second coming of Jesus, we know that that's something that all of us are going to keep. And um, all of us will be there and we will give an account of the things we've done in our body, whether it's good or bad. Second Corinthians 5 and verse 10. And so maybe in the course of your thinking, um, you realize you're not ready to stand before Jesus. Uh, hear the message of the gospel that uh, you're lost in your sin and there's nothing you can do in and of yourself to, to save yourself. It's going to take the sacrifice of Jesus. He already bore the wrath of God for you, but what you have to do is receive him. And then the way to receive him is to hear and to understand the gospel, to believe it so strongly you're going to change your life in repentance to confess Jesus to be the Son of God for others and to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins because you're reenacting the gospel. The gospel of 1 Corinthians 16, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, the God, that's the gospel enacted. The gospel reenacted is when we are baptized into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, Romans 6, 1 through 4. And so that's how we come in contact with the saving word. That's how we come in contact with the gospel. That's how we obey the gospel. And so <clears throat> in... Uh, Maybe you, you need to do that, or maybe you just need to, to get refocused and to lock in a little bit more. Um, whatever it is, we want to help you. We'll always attach the information here um, to this video on Facebook. And so if you need to uh, talk with someone or meet with someone, we're happy to do that and help you any way that we can. Um, but we all want to be ready to meet him. And that is a, a big motivator. And that's something that drives Paul all throughout this letter.